good evening. Thank you so much for showing up. It's nice to see all of you. Thank you. Uh, it is midweek, so it's kind of a heavy lift for many people to show up. Uh, some of you will be uh, 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 yanking yourself off a mattress at some awful hour tomorrow to go into a classroom or a courtroom or a cubicle. Uh, I sympathize with you all. Uh, thank you so much for showing up, and uh, thank you for the, the wonderful introduction. Uh, sadly, I only have an hour. I, I, if I had my way, I'd have you here uh, tied to your seats for about three or four hours. Uh, so uh, I, I must be brief. I wanted to talk to you tonight about being, uh, making the world a better place, which is a, a huge topic, but we can shrink it down and have some fun with it. If anyone seeks to gain knowledge, they also seek to gain some kind of elevation with college, with travel, with whatever wisdom that you can acquire from wherever and however you get it, you get a certain different point of view than someone who perhaps does not pursue. So with this elevation, you now have a choice. What you can do with what you know. With this elevation, you can hold it over people, you can use it for financial gain, or you can use it to have the world be everything that you see. Someone who doesn't look very far, their world is this big, their world is their town. I'm not putting them down. The world is their area code. The world is their family. I completely understand that, but that's limited. What if the world was your world? What if, if you spent enough time out in it that the world was the size of your world? Not your neighborhood, not your county, but the entire world. What if you could appreciate life from other perspectives in other parts of the world with other cultures, don't you think that would make you a better agent for change and benevolent goodness going forward? That's kind of an oxymoron. I apologize. Some people take what they know, and I don't like the intellectual type who takes their smarts and uh, seeks to belittle you with it. I've never been impressed. I've always been impressed by those who acquire knowledge by being on the road or reading books or whatever, and they use it to be helpful to others. And I am quite done with the idea of we. And I would really like a moment to explain that. Uh, just don't like me for saying that and let me dig myself out. Let, let me burn some lean tissue. In America, I don't think we shall overcome. We've had myriad opportunities to overcome. We're not that interested. From 1865 to now, with the death of Abraham Lincoln, the 13th Amendment, the 14th from 1868, my personal favorite, we've had many, many chances to overcome. We're just not that into it. Is that is because Americans are bad? No. I don't think that homo sapiens are we types. We're not a we species. We are we every now and then at games, but we're on different sides of the field. When we vote, we're all together, but in different, in different sides of an aisle. And then we get bored and we want to be individuals again and go home. There's marches where we, the people, we do this, but then everyone wants a bathroom break. And so Americans are put under undue pressure living under this moniker, the United States. 50 countries with 50 different cultures, with 50 different sets of values all getting together. The miracle of the United States is there hasn't been a second, third, and fourth civil war as bloody as the first one. And so for those who don't behave, I think we behave pretty well. But going forward, if you really want the world to be a better place, it is up to you, the individual, to choose to do good things. I can't make you. Only you can make you. So I am done with we, and I am just concentrating on you. What you're going to do now, and what you're going to do with it in the future. We are going down the drain. We stab a knife in the side of Mother Nature and twist it every chance we get. She gives us cancer. She doesn't mean any harm. She just wants to cull the herd just a little. We fight back. She makes deserts. We go live in them. She makes floodplains. We insist in living there. Do you realize the bubonic plague, Ebola, syphilis, cancer, is Mother Nature very benignly going like, cool it. I know breeding is fun, but you do it a lot. I got so much water. I got so many trees. I got so much breathable air. You're screwing up my equation with medicine, with technological breakthroughs. Thank goodness you're making the wars bigger, so it's kind of evening up just a little bit. So that's we. So I'm only interested in you. 
And I've come to the conclusion that people are basically ungovernable and they're untamable. And that's why any governmental delivery system, democracy, communism, socialism, whatever ism or assy you want to use, it's rife with problems. Why? The paperwork is fine. It's because there's people involved and people aren't bad, they just have a ton of ideas all at once. So we shall not overcome. You on the other hand can overcome and you can inspire someone else to overcome. And that's why you wanna travel. That's why you want to be part of change and part of something positive going forward. We all can't agree on anything for very long except oversleeping and pizza. <laughs> but you can do a lot. And late last year, I got an email from a woman. It's why I staggered onto the stage a few minutes ago with a steno pad in my, head, uh, in my hand. Usually, I keep all my information right here. I don't use any notes, nor do I take a drink of water, and I try not to say um or uh, and I rarely stop talking for very long. You'll see. So I got an email at the end of last year from a woman, and I'm not putting her in the pejorative, but I, use, I, I wrote down her, e her email to me, and I put it on my steno pad because I wanted to quote her. In one paragraph, she summed up the state of humanity. I, I, she nailed it. And I'm not trying to make fun of her. I'm not putting her in the pejorative at all. I think she got it. And I think she thought she was already in a conversation with me, and this was a second or third email to me. It was the only one I've ever received. So I'll read it to you. You see what you think. But in one paragraph, she got all of us together. Hi, Henry. I forgot to mention God's spaceships and Jesus returned in thousands of them during my lifetime to beam up all those who are ready then. Yes, there is a way out of this hell hole called planet Earth, and it is not so far off anymore. Check out Psalm 6817. He went, so he will come back again. Merry Christmas. I am on Facebook. Now, <laughs> in one cranial exhalation and one cerebral ha this woman was able to take in alien abduction as transport jesus god a judeo-christian holiday and social networking like do you want to hang out with this woman i do i think she'd be amazing and that just shows you in one paragraph one fell swoop how dynamic humans are where they can take in the spiritual the cutting edge of technology the the good book and all of that and and stir it all together and still walk a tightrope chew gum and not fall off and that's why humans are largely ungovernable. And that is why it's such a pain in the neck to deal with humans, because they are, for better or for worse, individuals. And so if you really want to help, if you really want to go forward, you have to take people as a living, breathing, thinking thing that are connecting dots and agreeing with themselves on basic essential truths. My father, who I haven't seen in at least 175 years, uh, I don't know how old he is, I don't know where he is, I don't even know if he's still with us. If he's still alive, he's probably crouching low in the weeds of Virginia, clutching an AR-15, waiting for a Fox News host to issue him his next directive. And, and <laughs> If any of you are Fox News fans, I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying that's where he goes, and he and I have a lot of disagreements on probably everything. And he, he was a PhD, and also a champion racist, and a magnificent homophobe, and a record-breaking misogynist. <laughs> and he, he never traveled. And my mother, on the other hand, to the left of my mother, is Bob Dylan in a wall. Uh, and so my mother dragged me all over the world as a little kid. You older folks remember when passports were green? I had one of those before they went blue. And so my mother would take me to Turkey, to England, to Greece, to Italy, so I could see the museums and dig other people. I saw a dead body in the street somewhere in Athens. I said, Mom, is that person dead? She said, yes. And I saw a dead person. And so I... I, I had registered that as a young person, like, wow, people do die, and that is a dead person. It, it blew my mind, like, wow, it's not a movie, it's real. And then I'd see my father, You're like, where have you been? You know, on the weekend, the 48 hours of fear with my father. And I said, I've just been to Istanbul. And he'd look at me like, y y and I won't say what he was probably thinking. Uh, but my mother let me understand that the world is a huge place full of people who are connecting the dots, who will, in my mind, basically skew towards moral decency and kindness and generosity if you put them in an environment with which they can do all of that. If you pressurize them, they will skew towards survival and they will climb over you to get out of the ditch and they will favor their kids over you. And so what do you need to do to make the world a better place? You have to put less people under pressure. And so for me to really understand that, 
I, know, I knew I needed to travel. And as a young person, I was in rock and roll. As a 20-year-old, I was going all over America. There's a few states I wouldn't go to, like it took me a while to get to the Dakotas. It took me a while to get to Hawaii and Alaska, but I eventually got to all of them. And in my time, I've probably met more Americans than any president. In fact, any two presidents put together. I'm not saying they're lazy. I'm just saying I'm around a lot of Americans all the time and a lot of Germans and a lot of Brits and a lot of people all over the beautiful continent of Africa and Central Asia and Southeast Asia. And I hear a lot of stories. I've been to seven continents and about 90 some countries. It doesn't make me an expert on anything, but it makes me uh, definitely interested in the human state. And I have found kindness and generosity everywhere I've gone, from here to Johannesburg to Dallas. I have found really amazing people. And so my gospel is, if you want to know, you've got to go. And the book and the documentary will get you partway there. It is an introduction. It is the brochure. But if you want the real deal, you need a passport and you need to go. And I use a fairly unorthodox way of travel. I go to a city, I drop my gear, I get some water, a camera, a protein bar, throw it in my backpack, and I just walk. I just find a street and go. Or I'll say to a cab driver, and they always think I'm a maniac, which is kind of true. I always say, give me $5 that way. Hey, what do you mean, my friend? I don't know. Put me that way. It's a pretty rough neighborhood. Well, I'm a pretty rough individual. It'll be fine. And so I, I go into places and I just basically walk around until people speak to me. And it's usually men in a lot of cultures. The men will talk to you, the women you need to be introduced. And so men will come up, my friend, why are you here? And I love that because it's my perfect international icebreaker. I, I advise it, you use it and see what you get. It's really fun. They say, my friend, why are you here? I say, why am I here? I'm here to meet you. My name's Henry, man. What's happening? And it always gets a laugh. And it always breaks the, the, the pressure. I was like, you're here to meet me? Yes, actually, I am. I really, really, really am. I left the hotel three hours ago, and I've been walking this way, and you're the first person to talk to me. So what's happening, man? And I think once that global conversation starts, if more people can have that conversation person by person, like Johnny Appleseed, just making, making friendships, it's going to be very hard to convince that local who you just met in Islamabad or in uh, Knoxville. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Once you make that human, that, that, have that human moment, it becomes hard to want to bomb that person. I was a child of the 70s, and so the, the, the Iranian hostage crisis was a big deal when I was in high school. I went to a boys' prep school. I wore this ridiculous uniform, black shoes, black socks, gray pants, black belt, white shirt, blue and gold striped tie, blue blazer with a corny insignia on the left breast patch side. And I was the kind of person you'd pull over your car just to beat up because I looked like someone who should be thumped. Some of my fellow students were Iranian. Their fathers were in the, the Shah's uh, administration, and they had money. And they sent their kids to American schools to avoid, I guess, conscription and to get a Western education. And they became my friends. It was Milad Kurami who got me out of high school because he helped me with math. And he was a math whiz. And I hated math because there's no rock and roll in math. And I would sit with Milad all the time. And he'd say, OK, Henry, here's an equation. Solve it. And I would write down, are we not men? We are Devo. He's like, Henry, no, no. <laughs> No, if you, if you don't learn, you will never leave. I'm like, I, I want to leave. If this is a gulag, he says, yes, listen to me, I hope you. And so I had this real soft spot for Iran. I wanted to learn more about Iran. And I had a president a while ago, as some of you did too. He did, wasn't great with the English language. Um, he had a, a tenuous hold on English, and I could never understand if he was kind of gaming me as a, as a, as a weird hip-hop, surrealist, absurdist poet, or if he just kind of didn't want to dig English all that much. But he told me, don't go to Arania, they're evildoers. <laughs> and so, one please. And so, uh, with that president, I started going to every single country he told me not to go to. When I was told, be very afraid, <laughs> I would go. And these are not easy visas to acquire. And so every day in Iran, I, I had a tour guide, uh, a government tour spy, and I would get rid of him every day around 1,300 hours, like one in the afternoon. I go, I'm jet lagging. I want to go take a nap and cry. And he would leave. And then I would just walk around the freezing streets of Tehran. It was, it was uh, late December. And I would just walk around by myself and just dig Tehran. And people were wonderful to me, and they're just unfailingly friendly to me, and they're so happy 
that I was there without judgment. And they were happy that I was there to learn, to shake hands, to say hello, to dig their music and turn them on to my music. And I got into an, a conversation with a young guy, a student age guy, and I said, what do you all do for music in Tehran? And he basically said, our scene is so underground, we need a shuffle to get down to it. We gotta be really careful. I said, could you make any use of a one terabyte drive of MP3s where you would take said hard drive and just give it to households and spread the, the, the virus of P-Funk, Black Sabbath, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington. He said, you could do that? I said, oh, I'll do it. I got a one terabyte hard drive. I worked all weekend. I have put in every single amazing song in the universe. 34 uh, gigabytes taken up. Like, really? I had to give it to my engineer friend. That my uh, engineer X and I went back and forth for months filling this damn thing with like 175,000 songs. It took about a year. We got that thing back into Tehran, where to, to this day it is still making the rounds, and P Funk and the Ramones are going from household to household. And so when the next president says, we got to go over there and straighten those people out, you can say, there's Ramones fans over there, man. You don't want to do it. They dig, they dig deep purple. You got to be nice. And this is my way of fighting back by meeting people all over the world, by trying to help. And we were talking about this before I went on about an hour ago, about the idea of helping in other parts of the world. And I don't know how many of you are American, but in the West, we do a lot of help in a lot of countries. I don't think it always hits its mark. Why? Because I think a lot of times when Western help agencies go to non-Western environments, they go in and they see a Westernize the problem they come in with a Western solution and they expect a Western result. And when they come back a year later and the copper has been stripped off the latrine and the windows have been broken and is covered with graffiti and, and human waste, they say, oh, you have squandered the great things I have given you. I didn't get the ending I wanted. And that's called donor fatigue. And that's what happens when you don't understand where you are. And that's what happens when you don't travel to these places and try and understand the culture. And in a place like Soka, where a student can liaise with people from several different countries and hear real stories about their youth and their growth growing up in these countries, what challenges they faced. That is the incentive to go to that country and start to understand, and in that way, be a help. You can even do this in America, because the reality of a Southern Californian is different than the reality of someone from South Carolina, or someone from Kentucky, or someone from Arkansas, where they might have a difficulty accepting the fact that there's global climate change. They might have a problem with literacy and stuff like that. Why is it easier to start a war than to build a school? That's all you really need to know because it's far easier to start a war than to build a school. So there's a lot of people who don't want people to be educated. They don't want to, people to travel to find out the truth. And one of the reasons I, I, I went to North Korea uh, was it took me three years to get that visa and I finally went. And what did I see? A bunch of poor, terrified people and a terrifying government. The people were afraid to look at me because they didn't know what I was. They're like, might be a spy, I might be a government agent. If I smile, I, you know, if they smile at me and say, and nod, they might be seen as being complicit with an American and they will get questioned. And when you see men and women living in an existence of fear, they pass the trauma on. The children are raised with fear and their lives are awful. And so I went, I was in Pyongyang and the surrounding areas for a week. And it was very, very sad. And I had this uh, government spy uh, with me every day, two of them actually. They were very suspicious why I was traveling alone. Because there's groups there, there's some Australians, some Norwegians, some Brits, and they're all together, but I'm alone. And I'm the only person in that general time of tourism who was alone. And they were really on me. And every day, what did you say you did for a living? And I had to lie, because I can't say, I've done a bunch of 
records, wrote a bunch of books, I'm in a bunch of movies, I'm just a pain in the ass in every media that you can imagine. That's not a satisfactory answer, so I had to kind of lie. I said, I'm an editor, which I am, of my own work, and I work at a publishing company that I own. And like, what kind of books do you edit? Really boring ones. And I was just, truth, truth, truth. And by the end of it, Kim, the male, uh, the, there's a male and female, and the, the woman rarely spoke to me. She just took notes. But Kim and I spoke all the time. And finally, right towards the end, they took me back to the airport. I'm flying back to Beijing. And he kind of broke. And, and he grabbed me by both my arms and shook me. He said, you are my friend. And he hugged me. And, and to see him overcome his suspicion of me, and, and you know how we men are. I'm, I, I love you, man. We just can't say, you are my friend, and I love you. We have to, I love you, man, you know, it's a different kind of love. And I can't hug you, because that's, you know, really lovey-dovey. It's all just like, yeah, man, I love you. But he put his arms around, like, wham! And like, kind of, like his chin and cheek are like into my chest. I'm like, aww. And I said, oh, well, he said, one day, I will come to visit you. And I said, yeah, man, you go on the internet, and you look me up. And when you get to L.A., man, I'll pick you up at your hotel. I'll take you out for the best burrito you've ever had. And he said, yes! What's a burrito? I said, doesn't matter. You will dig it after bite one. And I would love nothing more than to get an email from Kim saying, hey, I'm down the street from the Omen Hollywood. Come and pick me up. And I would like for Kim to see my country. I'd like him to get out of North Korea and see what the rest of the world is like instead of fearing it and thinking that my country wants to kill all the people in his country. And this is why I travel, not because I'm the nicest guy, because I'm a human, I have my good days and my bad days, but I'm so angry at the perversion of goodness in the world. I'm so angry at the next war. I'm so angry at the stinginess of rich people. There's two very, very wealthy people in America. They're brothers, you've heard of them, the Koch brothers. And I'm not here to beat up on them. I'm here just to make a, 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 an observation. Every third word out of their mouth is tyranny. Their, their, their current president is a tyrant, and they exist in this world of tyranny. It's, a, it's, it's tyrannical these times. You have $34 billion in your bank account. You can own a country. You can have anyone you want killed with a death ray. You can do as much pizza and sushi as you want. What tyranny do you understand? Shouldn't you be making the world a better place? Well, it's not going to be the Koch brothers, so it might as well be you. And so, in my opinion, I'm just, I can't tell you what to do. You're big, strong, grown up, sexy adults. But if you don't have a passport, get one. If you don't have a country or 25 or 40 that you want to go to, figure it out, make a want list, and start going. And this is what I do. Like I said 20 minutes ago, if you, if you want to know, You've got to go. And that's the, only, that's the only way you're ever really going to get it. And as far as help, I went to Haiti a few years ago. And I, I hate to tell this story because, I, well, I learned a big lesson, and it doesn't put me in the most flattering light. I had some time, and so I found that I could go to Port-au-Prince. I wanted to see what life was like there after the big earthquake. And so I thought I would do a solo, one-man punk rock mission. Uh, uh, half Joe Strummer, uh, you know, half Ian Mackay. I'm going to be a righteous, honest guy and be part of something positive. So I went alone to Port-au-Prince with a bunch of American money. And I said, I am going to find people and give them things and buy things with this money and make cash contributions and try and do some good. And it's very altruistic. But if you're a Western person going into a non-Western environment, you have to be very, very open-eared, open-eyed, and open-minded to get it right. So I get to Port-au-Prince, and I find a car company where you can rent someone and their car. I got a guy named Jimmy, and Jimmy picked me up in the car. He said, good morning, Mr. Rollins. I said, hey, call me Henry. I'm a maniac. It's cool, right? And we shook hands. He said, you're a maniac? I said, you have no idea. Wait till we're about three hours in. You'll see. And so he says, so what do you want to do today? I said, I, I want to go to one tent city after another. He said, Henry, you can't go into a tent city. It's very dangerous. And I said, I need to know. I want to, I want to go. He says, how about we park next to one and you can look at it? And I said, fine, because he gets me at least close. And so we go to one tent city, and there's a, an elevated street where you can look down 
at people below. And there's a deflated water bladder. There's kids running around in the dirt. And there's a bunch of adults standing around without a whole lot to do. And so I'm looking over at the tents and the lean-tos and the tarps. And a bunch of men come up to the wall and they look up at me. And they start shouting at me. I said, Jimmy, what am I, what am I doing? He said, they're angry that you're looking down on them. They feel that you're just you know, belittling them by staring. I said, well, I can't have that. That's not why I'm here. So I go running down the street, and I make a right into the tent city with Jimmy running at me going, no! I am surrounded by angry men who are this far from my face, putting their finger into my chest, yelling at me because I was staring down at them. And I'm like, oh, no, ow, ow, that hurts. But hey, I'm Henry, man. I'm from America. I'm here to check you out. And, and when Jimmy came up, he's like, please, my friend is a maniac. His name is Henry. He just wants to meet you. And everyone kind of caught their breath and calmed down just a little and stiffly shook my hand with a very hard gaze. And everyone calmed down. I said, okay, I got my pal Jimmy and a car and some money. I can't bring you 150,000 gallons of water. I know you need it. But I got a car and I got some time and I got some money. Is there anything I can do to help? And one of the men said, yes, we could use some soccer balls for these kids and some soap so we adults can do some washing and get a little dignity going because it's kind of kind of grimy out here. So I said, soap and soccer balls? We will be back as soon as we can with soap and soccer balls. And one of them basically said, that's a bunch of bull, you'll never come back. And I said, you have no idea how single-minded I can get. I shall return with soap and soccer balls. And I just lit out for the car with Jimmy behind me like, we're going to do what? Jimmy, we're going to have an amazing day. And I'm dragging him back to the car. We need to go to the money, the money changers. And there's some Street. He takes my American money, gets a good exchange rate. And we go into the supermarket and we find the soap section. And there's like these little eight cent bars of soap. And we fill up like all these baskets full of soap. We buy every soccer ball they have. They don't have the, the scanner, so they just have to count the soap. And there's a line behind us 321, 322, 300. And the people are getting angry at us because we bought all the soap they had. And so we go running into the tent city with big bags of soap, like this pinata, pinatas of soap and soccer balls. And we walk in, they're just like, just weighed down by like tonnage of soap and soccer balls. Men and women and children run at us, not up to us, they run at us. The bags are grabbed roughly, they explode. Bars of soap go everywhere. Soccer balls bounce into the dirt. The kids grab the soccer balls laughing and run. The adults are now fighting over bars of soap that you get in cheap hotels. They're about that big. Now the soap is on the ground. Now adults are on the ground. They're sweating. They get up with like four bars of soap. One guy has in a hand with a woman trying to extract one bar of soap from the man's dirt-covered grip. And he's threatening her. like He's yelling at her, get away from me. I've got some soap. And I realize that I have just screwed up a very screwed up situation by trying to help with the Western mindset. I know, I'll come in with some bars of soap and everything will be better. I caused a damn near riot. And a guy who runs the tent city, and I found out every tent city has the alpha that runs the whole place. He comes up to Jimmy and starts reading him the riot act about your crazy friend, the Westerner. And he starts yelling, and everyone stands still. And he, he does something else, and everyone spreads their hands. He takes, the guy has four bars of soap. He takes three, distributes them, and after a few minutes, everyone has a bar of soap. And people are still angry. They're still covered in dirt from diving on the ground for a bar of soap that you use once in a hotel and you leave for that magic person to come and clean up after you go to the airport. And so the guy translated back to me through Jimmy, you want to give something to this, this tent city? That's fine. You do it, but you do it through me. And here's my cell phone number. I bet you didn't think I had a cell phone, but I have one and here's the number. And so I was almost in tears. I, I had screwed up. I had let I would like to think I don't have too much hubris, but I'm just a person trying to do good, not understanding the situation, coming in with a Western mindset, westernizing a problem and hoping for a Western solution. Where we're like, wow, I'll take a bar of soap and you can have one and you can have one. Thanks for the bar of soap. Gee, thanks. Like, you're really helping me. Some nice white dude gave me a bar of soap and then he pissed off back to his air-conditioned hotel. And that's perhaps what they thought, but that is exactly 
what I was doing. And so I walked out duly chastened. I was just mortified at the crass mistake I had made because I didn't mean any harm, but I, I caused harm. And so uh, Jimmy said, so uh, what do you want to do with the rest of the day? I said, I want to go back and do that, but I want to do it right. And so we bought more supplies for different tent cities, and we'd either find the church or the one alpha guy who would just come bounding up to us like, my place, what do you got? And we're like, we have this, and thank you. And he like, and a bunch of people would show up, and he'd give, give me everything out and go, thank you, now leave. And sometimes they'd let me walk around, and sometimes they would kick me out. But I got pretty good at this by finding the lead person or the church and just making a donation. And Jimmy said, okay, you're doing pretty good. Uh, you want to meet some orphans? You want to play with some kids? I said, yeah, because who doesn't like kids? And there's a lot of lonely, beautiful children in Haiti because their parents are gone for one reason or another. And so we started making these visits to these orphanages. And I walk in, and all these kids see me. And then, you know, they, they don't know me from a movie. They don't know me from a record. They're not dazzled by my fantastic good looks and uh, my humility. But they, they see my Reagan-era tattoos. And those are funny. And they see a human jungle gym, new meat that has not been played with yet. And one child comes running up, play with me. And my reaction to that is perhaps a lot like yours. It's not, get away from me, beautiful child. You're like, yeah! You pick the kid up. Whoa! Air brakes, look out. <laughs> Whoa. Anyway, so I was a hit. I put the kid down and I look up and I see a line of kids. I'm like, oh, here goes the lumbar region. And so I started like picking up every kid, every kid. And these, these, these nuns are coming up. Henry, you've picked up every kid three point two times we have a clicker and I'm sweating through my clothes and I'm hugging all these kids and I did this for days at a time until my back would just go like you pick up one more kid we're gonna find your intestines in your socks and I didn't get pink eye I hugged a bunch of kids and I'm just just fine but that's what I did for a solid week making cash contributions listening to people's stories trying to make a difference and it wasn't we it wasn't some NGO it was just me and I just did that because I'm so, like I said, I'm not necessarily a nice person. I'm just angry at whatever forces combine to disenfranchise other people. And you see people in Haiti, their, their life is very, very intense. Here in the West, we talk about retirement. We talk about life insurance. We talk about vacations, which existentially do, does not work for me as an idea. I can't vacate anywhere. If I went from my home to Las Vegas, I'm just watching HBO in a different room. And so I don't go on vacations. I go on adventures. I want to come back eight pounds lighter with some insect burrowing into my, into my guts, laying its eggs. I want, I want a scar and something I did not know before. And I meet amazing people wherever I go, and I'm becoming better and better at helping and leading the way forward. I want to help prevent the next war. I want to help prevent the next famine. I want to help prevent the next mutilation of anybody anywhere. And I, I feel a duty to do this. The older I get, the more and more that occupies my time. Not that I think I'm better and I know a way, is that I have no damn excuse to do anything but that whenever I can. And thankfully, I yelled loud enough and waved my arms emphatically enough and I get to do a lot of good work all over the world. And I try and do a lot of good work in America and I try and go outwards with it. And there's a wonderful organization I've been working with for years called Drop in the Bucket. Dropinthebucket.org is their website and they drill water wells uh, in, uh, near schools in northern Uganda and South Sudan. And when young people get water, they can uh, be hydrated, it makes concentration better. They can keep themselves clean. And what you're finding is where there's water, there's literacy. And where there's water, there's literacy in females, which is a new thing in a lot of villages in this part of Africa. And what we're finding is with more, liter with more women getting literate, more women are running the affairs of villages. And apparently it's coming off. The women are going like, we're doing this. And the men are like, okay. Great. Uh, and that's what water does. And that's, that's a big help. 
But the coup of drop in the bucket is the, the actual American team is very skeletal. The people who drill the water wells, who make peace with the principal of the school, the, the local chief, and the, the liaising government of the, mo the biggest major city down the road, are people from the region. Where if you drop in the bucket, it's like a handful of people, but their people on the ground are local, and they understand who they're working for and how to do it. And when I am in Africa with drop in the bucket, it's just one lesson after another. However, you don't need to be an expert to, to go out and help. And I come at all of this from punk rock. I, I'm an angry person. You I love madly, but I am basically angry at those who would do harm to others. And so I go, I ask a lot of questions. I'm just basically a big pain. Like uh, years ago, I was in uh, Dubai eating dinner at the American consulate, because I'm cool like that. And I'm sitting with a bunch of really fascinating people. I said, is there one country you all would never go back to? Because they've been everywhere. Their lives are fascinating. And they all like dropped their salad fork and went, yes, Pakistan, never go. I said, well, why do we don't like Pakistan? They said, it's lovely, but it can go very south on you. I said, like, how? They said, you're walking down the street in Islamabad and everything's fine. And all of a sudden, a guy is chanting death to America. And then there's 20 of them. And then there's 200 of them. And we can't help you. So Henry, don't go. And you know me, note to self, go to Islamabad. And after wrapping out of a really dreadful film with Cuba Gooding, I, I jumped on an airplane and I got myself uh, via Dubai, um, uh, was it Dubai? Yeah. Uh, I, and so, uh, and off, off I went. And so, was it Dubai? I think it was. Anyway, I got to Pakistan and it was incredible. And I'd walk the streets every day and people would talk to me. And by sundown, you got to run back to your hotel, not the locals, the mosquitoes. And all of a sudden, like, <laughs> and they just land on you. And so you run back to your hotel and you wait for the bugs to leave in the morning, then I would go out again. By day three, the, the sky turns purple and the mosquitoes come out in clouds out of nowhere. I run back to my room, turn on Al Jazeera, and I see that Benazir Bhutto has been assassinated. Immediately, I get an email from this blonde tornado who's been emasculating and terrorizing me at my office for 19 years now. Her, its name is Heidi. And it said, like, the airport's been closed in Islamabad. You have all the adventure you've ever wanted. I hope you're happy. <laughs> and I realized my life had just become insanely interesting. And the next day I got up and the hotel is full of scary security men, men in Armani suits with the Uzi belt bulge in the breast, sleeping children from all the local embassies and worried executives. And so I go bounding out to the gate, which is festooned with soldiers. And I go, let me out. And they said, sir, it's crazy. Look at the smoke and fire. Go back to your room and play video games. Like me, a video game? <laughs> No, let me out. They said, sir, it's really dangerous. I said, man, I'm from America. I live in Los Angeles. I've been to Detroit. And they're like, oh, have a nice afternoon. <laughs> and so they let me out. And I spent the whole day outside watching men weep in the street. And you know, women came out at sundown for some reason, but there's only men and boys outside and things on fire. And people come up, my friend, uh, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm here to meet you, but you know, I'm so sorry about what happened. And they said, yes, it's a very tough time in Pakistan, and, and I'm glad that you're here. What made you want to come here? Oh, a bunch of people trying to fear monger me into not wanting to come to your country, and I just can't live like that. Life is too short, and I refuse to live in fear of of other, others of my species. I'm kind of that guy who's trying to pop all those bubbles as best as I can. And they thanked me for not judging them. They thanked me for making, making a visit to their country. And they were very, very sad. I had to see it in such a, a sad way. They said, if you came back another time, we could show you the city and, and you'd have a, a much better time. When I was in Syria, and I went because the sound of the city Damascus sounded bitching to me, so I said, I better go. And so I spent days walking all over Damascus, and I got back to America uh, through Lebanon to Heathrow to San Francisco International Airport, and I get taken into that small room, and I'm surrounded by angry men in uniform. Why'd you go to Syria? I said, because I'm Johnny Quest Jr. You know what's hot there? I go, are you kidding? You can fry an egg on your face at noon, man. It was really hot. Like, no, not that kind of hot, like hot politically. I was like, hey, man, I got a legal visa in my passport, and, and you think you have a uniform on and you're scaring me? Actually, it's just kind of a turn on. I love when authority tries to flex a uniform. Like, I'm intimidating you. Actually, you're not. 
Like, it's dangerous. I said, you live like this far from Oakland. You want danger? Go to a 7-Eleven parking lot and stand still for 10 minutes. You'll get danger. And eventually, you know, they said, and they, they had nothing. I hadn't done anything wrong. I just was curious, and I'm not afraid to go out into the world. And eventually, they're like, um, do you have any questions for us? I said, yeah. How, how long is this going to take? And they're like, oh, we're done. And on the way out, one said, oh, I am not supposed to tell you this, but big fan, big fan. And so, but from these travels, it's given me kind of this profound affection for Homo sapiens because uh, I meet people who don't have a great life expectancy. I was on the Niger River uh, my, uh, for my, my second trip to, to Mali, and I was going up the Niger with a, a Tuareg man who I'd been traveling with uh, the year before. His name is Mahmoud, and Mahmoud is great because he's such a worry wart. He, he is a, he's a good looking guy. He's like this kind of movie star, and the Tuareg are really tough. They live in the most forbidding part of the world. They live in the Saharan Desert, and their music's really groovy. So I was there to, to, for the Desert Music Festival. So I'm going up the Niger with him, and he smokes like a chimney, like one cigarette after another, like, like they're going to be banned by 6 p.m. And, and, and I, I said, Mahmoud, you're such a good-looking guy. You know, like, why are you burning up your insides with the, with the cigarettes? And he laughed, and he said, my friend, I, I am 30 years old. I was supposed to be dead four years ago. So there's a lot of people in the world, they don't see their life as an 80-year-old. They don't see retirement. They don't see life insurance. They see right now. Don't you think you could learn something by being with people whose life expectancy is half of yours, whose expectation of life is, in an hour, I hope I eat. Tomorrow, I hope there's some food. I know I'm going to eat tomorrow like you're going to eat tomorrow. You know you're going to eat tomorrow. That's never a thought in your mind. The most you spent without food is on some kind of juice fast or sometimes you got lost at the bus station and you couldn't find the candy machine. And I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying there are other people who spend all 38 years of their life wondering if they're going to have another bowl of rice. Don't you think your life would be enriched spending time with them? I think it would. Don't you think you could be a better leader going forward if you could get an on-the-ground understanding of how a huge part of the rest of the world works and how insanely different it is from yours? But the similarities are the great beauties of humankind. These people are wonderful to their kids. They're often very, very friendly. They have nothing and they'll give you half of it. They're just so happy that you took the time to ask about them. And it's really hard to want to bomb someone when you meet some of the friendliest people in the world in environments that are just so intense. And a week and a half later, you're back in your car driving to Trader Joe's with the dust of Kabul still in your boots. And it is very, very surreal. As you know, uh, in America, we've had this interesting relationship with Cuba for many years. And all your cool, sexy, adventurous friends used to go to Cuba via Toronto or via Madrid or via Mexico City. I snuck into Cuba. It was amazing. Henry, you've got to do it. Like, damn, I want to go to Cuba. And so a couple of years ago, I said, ooh, ooh, I want to go to Cuba. I'll sneak in through Toronto because I like the city. And my travel agent, Rita, who's retired, but she comes out of retirement for me because she says, you're nuts. I love how you travel. And she said, oh, don't worry. Your, your amazing president just made it okay for you to go to Cuba. And so I went to Cuba, and I had to go in part of a tour group, but thankfully there were like these brainiacs from Chicago. We had a really good time. And at one point, we're in the middle of, of the Cuban countryside. So it's one of the most beautifulest places you'll ever go. And it was 10 a.m. lobby call. We're going to drive around, and we're going to be, by 1 p.m., we're going to be at a farm where Comrade Fidel once touched a tree. And we're going to look at the tree and take the tour because Fidel invented geometry and agriculture and figured out the solar system. There's a bit of propaganda there. Kind of like how Kim Il-sung invented math and dirt and, and you know, corn. It, it's, you, you take the ride. Anyway, I get to the lobby at 10.03 in the morning. I'm very angry that, first off, I was late because usually I put the punk in punctual. Thank you. I've never said that before. And, 
And so at 10.03, I've been oil spotted by my Midwestern chums. And so I go running into the lobby. I go, did you just see a van? He said, yeah, they all left. I said, look, I got to get to that farm where Comrade Fidel touched the tree. He said, yeah, it's about four miles down the road. I said, great. How about you, you hook me up with a taxi? I'll just go there and wait. I got a book. I'll just read it. He said, taxis around here? You're a funny guy. I said, I'd like to think so. He said, uh, you, we can get you there on the public bus. It comes every half an hour. How about this? You wait in this lobby for 20 minutes. The bus will show up, and I'll let them know where you need to go, and you give them a few pesos, and you're on your way. I said, let's do it. And about 20 minutes later, the bus pulls up. It's a short bus, and I hop on. The guy explains, hey, take this, this guy to his friends at the farm. And the guy says, see. And I, I pay him some money, and we're sitting alone on the bus, just rolling down this dirt road. And he's driving. I am to his right in the front bench seat. And he looks at me and says, hello. And I said, hello. And he sticks out his right hand, like, like shake hands. Like, I shake hands with him. And he says, baseball. And I said, home run. I mean, we're just kind of playing word association, I guess. We shake hands on that. He says, me, Cuba. I said, me, America, and we shake hands on that. America, Cuba, good friends. I said, yes, and we shake hands on that. He says, you, America, <laughs> like, you're going to fly away. He goes, me, no, <laughs> and I went, oh, we shook hands on that. And then we went back, America, Cuba, good friends, forever. I'm like, yay! And I'm almost in tears because if he and I could be doing policy, we could get this done by noon, man. <laughs> like, it'd be great. Like, who are your two leaders? Me and this bus driver, man, we talked about baseball. We shook on it. Like, let's build a Starbucks over here and get it going. And so we get to this big dirt intersection, and there's a sign with Fidel with ubiquitous cigar touching a tree. And I'm like, aha, the farm. And I get up, and the guy goes, no, 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 sit, 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 sit. And so he takes me off his bus route. He makes a right turn, and we go like way down this skinny road to this farm. And he opens the door of the school bus, and this woman comes running out, basically with a clipboard going, like, you're not my one o'clock, it's... It's 1045, and he explains, this guy got lost. He's part of your one o'clock tourism group. Just put him somewhere for a while. And so the woman says, you know, come with me. I said, okay. And I said goodbye to the nice guy as he made 83-point turns to take a school bus. On a, I said, I'm sorry. He goes, no problem. I go, look like a big problem to me. But we waved, and he went away. And the woman said, come. And so I'm in the shade. I've got my bottle of water and my like nine inch thick book on Lincoln. And I'm reading about Lincoln. And she says to me, coffee? I said, every day, like a vitamin. And she comes back a moment later with this cup of coffee. You've had a cup of coffee like this. It, it has uh, that oil slick on the top and it smells faintly of cat manure. It's that sort of, oh yeah, the third eye will be coming out of my forehead any minute now. And so I drink half of the coffee and it is just fantastic. And the woman comes out again, she says, caramel? I said, really? Caffeine on a hot day with monosaccharides? What could possibly go wrong? So she comes out with these homemade caramels, all like, you know, you know hand patted down. So I drink the coffee and eat the caramel. She goes, more? I'm like, well, sure. And by my third cup of coffee and my second plate of caramel, I'm now sweating through my clothes. I'm levitating off my chair. I'm vision questing. I'm orbiting around the farm. The, the van full of my, my, uh, my travel mates shows up at one o'clock. I descend out of the sky <laughs> and I land in front of the vehicle like, ah, where'd you come from? I said, don't worry about it. I had a vision quest with a bus driver. We talked about baseball and the future relations of Cuba. All is going to be fine. I gnawed off the bark on the tree that Fidel touched to demarcate the tree. Come with me. And they said, caffeine much? I said, what do you mean? And I had the best time in Cuba alone with a bus driver. And those are two individuals agreeing that we can get along. And baseball was the, the lubricant. Baseball, home run, four or five handshakes were had. This is what people can do all over the world. And this is what makes the next war not exactly impossible, but way harder to sell. 
And the more that you travel, the more that you come back with great stories of the wonderful people from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and China and Mongolia and Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and Chile and, 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 all, and these beautiful places where you'll meet magnificent people and see geographic sites that are just staggering, You'll come back and go, wow, you know what? The world needs to be helped. The world needs more understanding. The world needs more partying, needs more rock and roll, more pizza, and it needs more people hanging out in places that they can't pronounce the name of the street, eating food. They don't always know what the ingredients are. And you know, there's always a tree to, to hug so you can projectile vomit. It's okay. I've barfed all over the world. You, you get over it. <laughs> One of my best projectile vomits was in Rangoon in Myanmar, and I knew it was coming. And I was like, I was a pro thrower upper. I was like, okay, hold on. This will take a moment. Arr! All right, back to tourism. And I just kept on going. <laughs> anyway, uh, this, this, this is what I do. And this is why I do it. And I think in this century, and this is the only one that you and I have, none of us are getting out of this century. And global climate change is real. And the industrialization of war, the profiteering of war is real. I predict in our lifetime, the biggest technological breakthroughs will be, uh, for the consumer, you'll be able to take a higher res photograph of your pudenda, Latin for the naughty bits, I learned that in eighth grade, uh, to like sext your friends and the, and the the bigger breakthroughs will not be uh, in medicine. They will be in weapons and weapon delivery systems. So you can kill people more anonymously from a greater distance and not have to see the blood or hear the screams and not have to clean up after it. And so it is up to humans with the, a humanitarian gleam in their eye to take these good messages forward. And I don't know if we can do it, but I'm absolutely sure that you can do it. And so in this, in this century, it is the individual who is going to make the change. And that's people with an education, people who are privileged with an elevated point of view. And like I said an hour ago, you can use that as a force for good, or you can just make a bunch of money and just be a big pain in the neck and, and a kind of a stop block to progress. And with progress comes equality, and that's a big problem in the world. Uh, like I said, it's easier to build, uh, to, to start a war than build a school, because the school gives you equality. The school would change Wall Street. The schools, the schools would change the demographic of neighborhoods, and there's people in this country who will not tolerate that. That is who you're up against, and that is what you're up against all over the world. Those who have, who don't want to share. And so, you must be a generous person, and that's what I try to be. And sometimes I have to fight my own idea of I need to stay alive by being generous with my time, by going for weeks in places that are really tough to get around, shutting my mouth, listening, learning, interviewing people, taking notes. And the older I get, the more fascinated and the more kind of angry I get to get more information. And my anger goes hand in hand with my curiosity. I'm angry to know more. I'm kind of angry at any country I've not been to, in that it kind of dangled like, Henry, I'm Yemen, ooh, 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 ooh. damn, I wanna get there. And I'm angry at any politician who starts some stupid war that prevents me from getting to these countries. I take it personally. And so this is what I can't advise, but this is a way forward. And hopefully at SOCA, you student types are soaking up other cultures, other ideas, other perspectives. Hold on to them because they are your intellectual gold. And this is how we go forward. Last year, at the end of the year, I, I had some time. So I called my travel agent, Rita. I said, Rita, I have part of November free and I just said the word Antarctica, and she flipped out. You have to go in November, it's when the penguins are mating. Okay, because like you need to see penguins have sex because, you know, hurry. And so I said, well, book that one. And so weeks later, I'm in a boat going through the Drake Passage on my way to the edge of the Antarctic Peninsula. And so for the first three days, there's nothing to do. There's no place to land. So I took lectures. And I made friends with Bob the geologist because Bob taught me about catabatic winds and glacier ice and sea ice and how uh, fresh water goes into cold weather systems and it freezes. And that's why NASA says there's more ice at the bottom of the world and all the climate change and I see the world's, the world's getting cold. Are you socialist? 
But the real explanation is, and it's a really awful thing, that the, the fresh water goes into systems it's never been to before. It is pretty much free of saline, so it freezes very quickly. The water level doesn't rise. It's just a distribution of fresh water. Unfortunately, it pushes down the more dense, saltier water, which contains all the nutrients for the phytoplankton, which is the microorganism, which gives the world half of its oxygen through photosynthesis. The phytoplankton are also the principal food of krill, which is the principal food of whales, seals, and penguins. And so a food chain is being broken down. This has been happening for decades. And not only are the animals losing, but you animals and this animal is losing as well because we have less natural oxygen factories. They're getting shut down year after year because not only do people keep breeding and keep flushing toilets and taking jet airplane rides, I'm a perpetrator, but we keep not listening to science and we keep saying, oh, the, what a bunch of... And so at one point, I'm, I'm standing uh, amongst a bunch of breeding, braying, crapping Gentoo penguins with Bob the geologist. And so here are all these beautiful penguins covered in their own excrement, running after each other. Ah, ah. It's, like an, it's like a weekend in Amsterdam. Um, <laughs> And so the penguins are, you know, very sexy. It's breeding time. And, and so I'm standing with Bob amongst a bunch of Gentoo penguin. And I said, so, so tell me what a citizen might not understand about global climate change. He said, well, first off, it's real. This is what I do for a living. I live nine months of the year in this area for the last decade and a half. I really, really, really know what I'm talking about. He said, what you're going to see, uh, what you don't know, is that it's worse than you think. And what you're going to see in this century is a rising sea level to the point of catastrophe. So I said, what do you mean? He's like, coastlines changing. So I said, you have a, you have a place like New Orleans. Uh, could that be impacted like no more Bourbon Street? He said, something like that. I said, what about the state of Florida with water on both sides? Is it possible you could have rising sea level where all of a sudden Florida turns into a subliterate, science-resisting, uh, uh, President Obama-hating, single-tooth cracker Atlantis? <laughs> and he saw this look of gentle hope in my eyes like, <laughs> and of course, I'm kidding. He said, Henry! I said, well, you know. And he said, yeah. That's, that's what we're up against, and that's what you're seeing at the bottom of the world. That is the change. And so if you want to change that, you also have to be part of a change. And so I can't, like I said before, and I say over and over again, I can't tell you what to do. You're all grown up. I wouldn't dare tell you what to do. But if you want to have a lot of fun, there's a lot of ways to have a lot of fun. My fun is to go out into the world as far and as wide as I can and ask a lot of questions and shake a lot of hands and eat a lot of interesting food and dig as much interesting music as I can and walk into all these neighborhoods, into souks, into bazaars, along rivers, along railroad tracks. Sometimes in Indonesia, people sleep in, in cemeteries and, and the Christian half people sleep and the Muslim half people don't sleep. So I go into the Christian half of the cemetery and I pe meet people who live in a cemetery and I play with their kids and I find someone who speaks English. And they're really like, wow, you have a lot of really bad tattoos. I go, yeah, well, how about we all get together and laugh at them for a while? And the kids think I'm the most hilarious thing they've ever seen. And we all have a wonderful laugh. And this breaks down the idea of war. It breaks down the idea that part of your duty as a, as a human, as an educated, culturalized person, isn't to go out, out into the world and spread some of that. And that is the, I am convinced, that is the only way the world is going to get better. It is not going to come from any government. I'm not cynical, but I do not expect any government in my country or anywhere else to make anything better for its people. I think in America, it, corporations run the government, both sides of the aisle play into it. And so, like I said, us, we the people, done. I'm only interested in you and what you're going to do in your own country, wherever that country is, and what you're going to export, wisdom-wise, and what you're going to import. And that is the great change in this century. And what's really fun about that is we know, and therefore we can be a part of that. I feel sad for anyone who doesn't have a passport, who doesn't have the means to travel, who can't help change things on a global scale. Thankfully, those people can work locally. I live in Los Angeles, uh, which is a great distance from here, especially in the rain. Uh, at least time-wise, it was like three hours to go this far. 
But I contribute to a local orphanage in Los Angeles, Holly Grove Children's Services Center, great place. They work with local kids, and that's a way you can make a change in your own area code. So you work where you can see it. Think if everyone did that, if everyone extended themselves that much, and they may, tried to make that much of a difference, and you add that to that to that to that to that to that to that, and all of a sudden the world is a different place. You're up against the biggest money and the biggest political forces in the world, and so that's why I vote, because the more I vote, the more I help make democracy in America transparent. However, I don't expect anything from any politician, even the ones I vote for. However, I have high expectations for you. My chips are on you. I'm betting on you to make this century better. You are what I depend on, and I do not think we are going to fail. And so hopefully tonight, I, I, I feel somewhat hamstrung with only having an hour with you. As you can tell, I really like being up here. Not that I have a great love of the sound of my own voice, but I really am hot on this topic. I travel and I, I, I go out into the world as often as I can. Coming home is a bummer. I come back to my house and after 72 hours, I am really depressed because the rest of the world is waving. I, it's only mid-February. I am 13 countries into the year so far. I just came back. I was, I was just in Ukraine the other day. I was in Kiev and I drove by uh, Independence Square. And you know what happened in Independence Square in, in Kiev a few years ago. These people stood up to their government and got killed. They got their brains put on the sidewalk. They got lead pipes smashed into their skulls. And they stood up to what they thought was a better idea than what their government had proposed. And I'm standing in front of like 600 people. And I said, how many of you took part in standing up for yourselves? at Independence Square, and everyone raised their hand. I go, all of you? And they went, well, yeah, man. You'd get off work, you'd go for four hours, and then go home and, you know, do your homework. We all did it. And I said, um, you might be happy to see me, which is cool, but I'm happier to see you, because I've never had one day in my life where I had to be brave, not one single day where I had to be courageous. I've, had, I've been in schoolyard fights, like, at 3 o'clock, I'm going to kick you. And you're like, I'm, you're terrified for the rest of the day. You're vomiting and out of fear for the rest of the day. That's not brave. You just, like, run home and eat your SpaghettiOs. That's not that dangerous. But these people stood up to that. That's what humans can do. This is why I travel. This is why I try to meet these people. This is why I bring these stories back and drop them at your feet like a pheasant. I want all of you to be part of that. I want you to travel as far and as wide as you can and change the planet. Because all it, it's people that change the planet for better or for worse. You can't change a shark. They do what sharks do. But you can definitely influence other people by curiosity, by bravery, and an unerring inherent goodness, which I think comes from, as Lincoln said uh, in, uh, in 1838, one of his early speeches, that we need to have a general love for our species. And that's what I have for, for us. That is as we as I get. I dig homo sapiens, and then when I micromanage, there's a lot of wonderful people I've met, and I've met them in about 90 countries over seven continents. And this is why I never feel old. I get tired, my knees hurt. I turned 55 the other day. Well, thanks. Well, thanks. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> but as far as how I feel, I don't have an age. I'm just here right now. That's the only thing I'm concerned with, not what I did. Only what I'm doing, and even more interesting, what I'm gonna do. And I'm fascinated by what you're doing, and especially what all of you are gonna do. I'll see you out in the lobby. Thanks for enduring me. Good evening, thanks. Thank you. Oh, I forgot, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I am somewhat of a Pavlovian soul. Uh, I am used to striking the mic, running off stage, and hurling myself into an ice bath. Uh, but we're going to do a Q&A thing, and I am going to be the bad cop. And so, apparently, I need to reset my stopwatch, which is brought on stage for your benefit, not mine, because uh, I never want these shows to end. Um, how about this? Uh, we're given, what, 15 minutes? 
the powers that be have given us 15 minutes. Uh, how about this? Um, I'm going to time us, and around 15 minutes or so, I'm going to go like, we need to stop! And if any of you have any, any burning questions that I don't get to, we can resume in the lobby. But for the next 15 minutes, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask. But if you're shy, which I can totally dig, not everyone wants to walk up to a microphone. Uh, if, you don't, if you have a question you want to ask it later, or if you're too afraid to stand up, if there's no questions, I can ask myself a few questions. But if any of you have them, uh, there's microphones strategically placed in different parts, and the lights come on, and there's... Okay, so first you, and then you, and then you. Well, you need to get up to a microphone, ma'am. Okay, so, hello. Thank you. Um, first, uh, you've inspired me for many years, as well as everyone else in here. So I just wanted to say thanks for broadcasting your words. It's got me through a lot of dark periods. I'm only getting warmed up, my friend. All right, so... Here's the deal. Uh, the part of uh, Get in the Van where you leave your corporate gig has, has really inspired me lately. Uh, I spend about 10 to 12 hours in a cubicle every day. It's crushing my soul, and I'm preparing to leave <laughs> to start my own venture. If it does fail, I don't think it will, but if it does, uh, and I end up you know, in a van down by the river, do you have any jewels of wisdom to kind of keep me company and, and uh, solidarity? So basically what you're asking is you're giving up the, the kind of... Uh, ritualistic life of going to the workplace and going for an artistic future? Uh, maybe not artistic. It may be entrepreneurial, but... Okay, but so basically you're taking a big risk in the adult world. I, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I can only speak from my own experience. When I went from a minimum wage job into rock and roll, I immediately went from minimum wage poor to like exceedingly indie band broke. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, nothing was going to stop me except death. And I'm not a tough guy. I just had no idea that anything was going to stop me. I had no idea of failure. I had only just like, I'm going forward. And that's it. And I don't have any confidence whatsoever. I got none. I'm not into myself at all. I just knew that going back to that, to that what I thought was a mediocre life that ends up something that Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about. He's working and scooping. I, and... Long may he wave. I'm just saying I knew what I had to go back to, like you can go back to a cubicle. And I let what I could go back to be the energy to keep me from not going back to it. So there's really nothing that was going to stop me, which is kind of a crazy way to be. It made me a very hard person to be around. I was in a band that you may remember. And all of us were some of the most hard driving, hard to be around people you've ever met because failure for us was not an option. Our idea of success wasn't big money. It was, you will, you will listen to us. We will get an audience and we will demolish people with our music. That was the goal. And we achieved it. But the thing that was behind us was, it's either this or real life. And I will not accept real life. I have an imagination. I will not take it. And so... Thank you, Henry. Good luck and be brave. Run at it. You live once. Yes, sir. Hello, so my name is Alex. I'm a fourth year at SoCo, woo. Um, thank you so much for coming today. So my question as a young person is, how do you live without guilt in that? Um, and in the, I ask this in the sense that like, um, as much as we all would love to travel, you know, ultimately some of us aren't privileged enough. And thankfully we come here to SoCo so we can travel and we can experience that. But you know, I've put myself in multiple boxes to avoid traveling because out of guilt of, you know, I can't have all of my friends back home travel with me. I can't um, meet everyone. So like, how do you live without guilt? Uh, yeah, so how do you live without guilt, I guess? <laughs> Thanks for a great question, Alex. Um, who says I live without guilt? Uh, I, 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 I know I have it really good. I'm a lucky bastard. Uh, and so the way I alleviate guilt is I try and take all the privilege I have, all the doors that open for me when I ask, and I try and turn it into something good. I could hog it all and just take it home and go like, I had a great experience and I can't tell anyone about it. This is mine and it's not yours. And so I'm a storyteller. I go to really crazy places and you know, museums open up on days that are closed. All kinds of cool stuff happens for me. And so I bring it to the stage and I tell these stories. And I'm just some guy from your neighborhood. I'm nobody from nowhere. I'm a high school graduate from the last century. I'm not supposed to be anything uh, going anywhere. And so if I can do it, you're gonna easily eclipse anything I'm gonna get up to. And so the way I alleviate guilt is I try and give away everything that I get and that in my own way by telling stories. 
by going places and just coming back with the goods and hurling them out to people. And people have said to me for many years, I have a family. We got what we got. We are not going to go to Europe. It's not going to happen until the kids graduate, if they graduate. And so me and my family, we travel through you. We live through you and your books and your stories. That's why every year you come to Cleveland, we are at the show because we want to go on your shoulder. And that's why I write those journal books. And I write them, as David Lee Roth once said to me, as a result-oriented performance because I am taking you, the reader, on my shoulder. And that's why I take a camera everywhere and a headlamp so I can see and bring back the story. That's how I, I make it okay that I get to go that I get paid a lot for not doing a whole lot all the time. I'm not building a building. I'm looking fantastic on stage with great lighting. <laughs> and so that's, that's what I do. And that's how anyone can do it. And so um, by traveling as far and as wide as you can, you don't infringe upon anyone else's life. If your friends don't get to go along, then just come back with a gift and a good story. But you're a young person. Get out there, man. <laughs> Believe me. You're going to wake up one day really soon, like in about six weeks, you're going to be 55. And <laughs> you'll see. It, if you think your youth has gone as fast up to now, you, 20 years is going to feel like 20 minutes, man. And you better get out there while you're still good looking and your knees work. You'll see. You, Thank you. you. You and Aspirin, you're going to make some good friends. Okay, so it was someone way up. Was it you? Yes. Hi. Uh, you know, I can see you're still a very angry man but not maybe as angry as at Fender's Ballroom in Long Beach or the Palladium in Hollywood. Um, how now, as you go out and you see the injustices that you must encounter, that you talk about somewhat, but you seem to focus more on the positive things that you see in your travels, how do you keep from falling back into that old school anger that's, I guess, how do you keep the anger channeled into a positive direction versus letting it bring you down? Thank you for the question, it's great. When I was a young person, I was very, very angry. Now I'm an old person and I'm angry. But my anger is different. When I was young, my anger was very centralized. It was very rooted in myself. And it saw no solution. It just saw this endless burning. And now my anger is a cousin to curiosity. And now my anger is motivational. And so I can do something with it that's not kicking a wall or calling someone a name. I can, I can improve a situation. And it's through the privilege of travel and luckily being open-minded enough to shut my mouth, which is very difficult for me, mm -hmm. to shut my mouth now and then and hear someone else's reality. Try to put myself in it, but mainly try and understand that someone's coming from something as real as mine is for me, it's real for that person too. And so that was, a, that was a gift that I was able to get. And so I took advantage of it. And that's why I was able to flip that around. Because as a 23-year-old, my anger was, I hate cops because I see them do bad stuff to people who don't deserve it. And I hate myself. And I hate this guy who just spat on me on a show. I just did. And you know, so that's like really local. It's kind of like the, the, the hate in your own area code. And so I was angry about that. But when you go out into the world and you see bigger problems that are bigger than you, but you also see that you can be part of a solution, for me it was kind of just almost self-evident, like, I need to do this. And I didn't necessarily turn into some like goody-goody tree-hugging type, but I just saw that I was wasting my time and that my anger was somewhat self-involved, which is okay when you're young, but it was also timid. It was cowardly, because it's not really confrontational. And so I, uh, you'll laugh, but it's true. Nietzsche, I know, got young men in Nietzsche. But Nietzsche taught me to go after more worthwhile adversaries. And I read, you know, a chunk of his books, the Kaufman translations, not the Hollingdale. And I did get some of it, some good out of it. And that was the main thing I got from Nietzsche was like, pick really good adversaries, ones that can hit back. And I've said that to a few angry political pundits. I'm like, you're picking on the wrong people. Pick on me. Let's, because I will, I will, I will stand here and go toe to toe with you. Mm -hmm. And so I won't name any names. I'm just saying that they they pick on people who can't hit back. Uh, I one time I, uh, I advised uh, one right wing political pundit. I said, um, 
you, you're up against this person and me and that person and that person. Me, I'm taking on famine. I'm taking on thirst. I'm taking on food and water insecurity and water and airborne diseases globally. And you're taking on that, that guy because he uh, is okay with Bill marrying Tom. I know who rules the roost here. I know who's going after that, which can really hit back. And so once you get a taste of that, how, how could you possibly go back to, you didn't like my record, so I have to kick your ass now that you gave me a bad review. It's, it was, it's been impossible for me. And maybe that's just me meeting but when, maturity. But when you're traveling and you see injustice, like if you see- I see it all, I see it in my own area code. I see it everywhere I go. How does it not make you furious? Because I know that I can't change all of it, so I just pick off some stuff I can do, and I do the best I can. I lend my voice and, my, and I give money to organizations who I agree with, and I try and, you know, I'm one guy, so I don't try and fix all of it, because all, all you do is worry, and just, just wait, sit there going, ah, everything is a mess, like it is. But you can clean up that spot and that spot, and if everyone cleaned up a spot, Oh, what a wonderful world it can be. And that's, way, that's how you can get active and make it personal. Like I, 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 and soon as, yeah, as soon as you can own it and have some ownership of like, I did that. Then all of a sudden, man, you just, it becomes addictive. Giving, being part of a solution, you can't wait for the next opportunity, which I'm sure you understand what I mean. And that's, that's how I deal with some of the really awful things I see. Like in Madagascar, you meet kids. There's no way those kids are alive now, the ones I met in, 2000, in, in 1997 or 98 when I was there the first time. I, I, uh, sorry, the only time I've been to Madagascar. I was thinking of Kenya. Um, in Madagascar, you meet the kids with the stomachs are out to here and they don't look good. And you're like, there's no way that kid's hitting 20. And then a week and a half later, you're back in Los Angeles driving to Trader Joe's. Or you go to Haiti and you see the orphans there and some of the stomachs are descended. And four days later, you're back in Miami where it's like breasts that defy gravity, smooth foreheads, and people own these castles. And you're like, wow, I share a planet with that place. It's 90 minutes by plane and I'm going back home. Or when you go to Tibet and you see the Chinese soldiers crushing the dignity of, of Tibetan people and there's some of these most gorgeous humans, the, the elderly are, the lines in their face, the strength in their hands, they're just, they're begging for a portrait. They're just beautiful, gentle people, and the Chinese are, are just destroying that culture, and you see it, and you weep, and you get on a plane, and you, you go home. And so it's very easy to feel like a schmuck, unless you do little things here and there. Otherwise, all you feel is sadness and Futility. I can't do it. I gotta be able to move on something. Sorry for tying a long tail onto that kite, but thanks for asking. Yes, thanks. Hi, my name is Jeremy. Thank you for being an inspiration and uh, using your anger to, cha to uh, cha channel change. Um, you know, I host a community outreach project called Do You Like Sandwiches, where we uh, we gather volunteers and we take uh, sack lunches out in the community and serve humanity. And um, how, do, how do I continue to do this unselfishly? And how do I continue to reach out and, uh, and gain volunteers, not only in my local community, but in the communities outside of the area that I live in? Well, just, talk, just hearing you talk for the last 17 seconds, I'm inspired. In that you're bringing sack lunches to people? You've inspired, you have just inspired everyone in this building. Boom, you just, a bunch of light bulbs just went on. And so you're looking for some more people? I think you probably found a few right here. Thank you. Congratulations. I mean, you just do what you do and hopefully you get some witnesses and they go, wow, how'd you do that? You want to do it with me next Saturday? Yeah, great. And all of a sudden there's two of you. Sweet. I mean, to me, I think you're about 99% there. You are doing something. And like, who, who, who's hungry who can't use a lunch? You're changing lives. You're not changing the world. You're changing worlds. And that's what one person can do. And you're doing it. And everyone has just heard that you do that. And I bet uh, you could probably voulez vous in the lobby and pick up a couple of allies before you get back to your car. That's how you do it. You're like a snowball going down the mountain. You pick up, you get bigger as you're old. Momentum. Thank that's, you. that's what I would do. I would just. All right. 
Um, you uh, talked about how much you hate fear mongering and you know, you um, don't want to live in fear. However, um, you know, it just made me think about this uh, current political, all the debates and um, the fear that's, uh, you know, the underlying message for uh, what all the politicians are talking about. I just wanted to find out, you know, what you thought about that. And um, <laughs> uh, you know, thanks for the solution. question. Uh, fear works. If fear divides easily, uh, when you can convince someone uh, that they're the root of your problem. It's, it's, it's those people, it's the gay people, it's the brown people, it's those women who think they should be running a corporation. And all of a sudden, when you can divide people, that's how you get votes. That's how people put up with gerrymandering. That's how they vote out of their, boat, their best interests, because they've been given fear. And quite often, it's very easy to get someone afraid. Tell them that their family's in danger. Tell them their house is going to go upside down. Tell them about their mortgage being in peril. People, all of a sudden, big, strong adults get really, really scared really, really fast. And it works in this country. Why? Because we don't put enough emphasis on education. We could, we're just not that interested. You might be, I might be, but we, America, don't seem to be. Otherwise, it would be very, very different. You can build a drone, you can build a school. And so we're not that interested in that. And that's how people get votes these days. It's not like a guy like President Johnson, who said, I'm an ugly guy from Texas. I got one year of looking like a swan. And so I'm going to shove so many you know, like great society deals through before I turn in to like garbage when they all hate me. Let's go. And he used his political capital because he actually wanted to do good. And like half of the country hated his guts for it. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 realized that half of your country opposed it. Geographically, you can guess where that is. But they protested vociferously. And so why? Because we still think and vote along the battle lines of 1861 to 1865. And so that just shows you trauma lasts a long time. It hops generations. It hops into people's DNA. Fear works. And instead of having politicians that want to bring people together, divisiveness seems to be the order of the day. And uh, it's too bad that it works. It's too bad that people make their circumstances more wretched. We'll bring more jobs. You're going to make the water in your local water table totally polluted by letting that company build their thing. It'll be jobs. You're going to, your kids are going to come out with an extra head in 10 years. You are destroying your local environment. Are you one of those science pussies? Yeah! I'm just a layman fan who has common sense. But fear works in this country. And if you had a more educated electorate, they'd vote differently. If, you, if they all had passports, if every single kid who graduated from high school was wrenched from his or her America, sent to India, Chile, Argentina, China, and said, you're going to help build a bridge, build a school. You're going to be a camp counselor for these kids for six weeks. And all of a sudden, all uh, kids would come back with a, a few visas in the passport and a whole different view of how to be the stewards and makers of the future of their own country. And, and that would be a fix. I just don't think that we're that interested. We are not interested in the fix. You are, I am, and therefore it can get done one individual at a time. I certainly hope so. I have a 17-year-old who's going to be an 18-year-old first-time voter, and he just cannot believe the fear in the political landscape. He thinks it's absolutely ridiculous. Good. And he's like, he'll, why? He'll be it, least, so he won't cave in. He won't fall for it. I certainly hope not, and um, or I hope he won't cave in. Um, but I just would love to see the fear being taken out of, uh, you know, everybody's or you know the um, the politicians yeah, it, and it's why I I uh, I take the advice of Flavor Flav. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and you know what he said, folks. He said, hang loose and never shut up. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I can do. Um, and that's, you know, your son will get it. I mean, with a mom like you, he'll be fine. Um, way up there in the cheap seats. <laughs> yeah, the nosebleeds. Well, thank you for everything you've said tonight. I wanted to um, ask if you could say something about the in-between. We have one extreme of distant travel, and we have one extreme of uh, local you know, helping with sandwiches and these kind of things, and they're all part of the same generosity or, or curiosity. Can you say something about how people, first of all, the cost of living in this area is, is prohibitive, and even in, in California. So for people that want to have a grass, grassroots uh, lifestyle and not get caught up in the consumerist machine, how might we, maybe via uh, internet, 
create friendships with people on the other side of the world or get a, a glimpse into their life uh, so that we can travel there and have an idea of where and why. We're not in, in your position yet. Well, I, I think y you need want to. Yeah. Um, there's, I, was in, uh, I was in India a few years ago. Uh, I, was, uh, I was there for the, the uh, 25th anniversary of the Bhopal disaster. I decided I must go and be there for that. And I met this young guy. And I said, so, you know, young Australian, I think. I said, how are you getting around? He's some ruffian with a backpack. He said, there's this really good website where you can write people, and basically it's crashonmycouch.com. Cool. And he's just been cruising, he's been couch surfing around the world. Yeah. I said, what's that like? He said, home cooking, hot showers, laundry, really friendly people, you know, maybe the occasional bed bug. Uh, but there's ways to get out into the world and get around if you really want to do it. it just, uh, you know, global travel, that curiosity, wanting to get out into a different part of the world, uh, unlimited resources, it just takes desire, some innovation, and uh, persistence. I, you just, I'm a, I can't make you understand how limited I am. I, I'm, I'm not smart, I'm not good at anything but procrastination and oversleeping. And I've been able to get pretty far and wide because I really wanna. And humans are crafty. Once they get motivated on something, like, you know, talk to any junkie, they'll find money. They will, yeah, yeah. They, they will just, they, if you really wanna, I'm not saying, hey, become a junkie. I'm just saying, um, there's really nothing that stands in front of you that you, if you really wanna break through, you'll break through. I know that there's a lot of limitations and a lot of things that can get in your way. Um, but the more joyfully you go at them, uh, the more uh, have fun you can have knocking it down. And that's a little tree-huggy and hopey changey. Uh, but if you really want to go somewhere, save the damn money, get your passport, and like get going. I got it. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. Uh, so guess what? Um, it's, it's time to go into the lobby. We've exceeded our Q&A time. And isn't it fun that we all get together in comfortable seats and watch an old man wither in front of you? <laughs> and so I, I'm going to decamp, and I'll see you out there. Thanks, 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 thanks. Thanks. You're marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. <laughs>